In 2002, I was a sophomore in high school. It was a rainy weekend and I decided to invite four friends over to my house to hang out. My parents were gone for the day. My one friend David thought it would be cool to bring over a Ouija board. It was an older board he got from his grandmother's place after she passed away six months earlier. He claimed that this would be the first time he had used it. My friends and I had always been intrigued by paranormal things so we all agreed to play with it. None of us had ever used one before but we all had a general sense of how they worked from watching horror movies. In those films there was always at least one skeptical friend laughing it off and joking around about it. In our situation we had one of these friends and his name was Drew. But we wanted to take this seriously so we left Drew on the sidelines as an observer. The remaining four of us would each play an important role. Taking this as seriously as we could, we looked up online the safest way to use this thing. We lit five candles around the room which, by the way, was in my basement, but was converted into a guest bedroom. The candles illuminated the room just enough for us to see each other and the board itself. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon, but looking out that single window in the guest room, it seemed dark with the rain coming down, and we were ready to begin. Drew was sitting off to the side against the wall, out of our way but still making jokes about this whole ordeal. David was seated on a couch to the left of me, who was going to be asking the questions. Mark was seated in a chair to the right of me, ready to write down the questions and answers on a notepad letter by letter as the planchette hopefully moved. Then there was Melanie, seated across from me on the other side of the Ouija board. We would be the two people with our fingertips on the planchette. Before we began, Mark read a protection prayer. None of us were really that religious, but we thought it wouldn't hurt. He began. In the name of God, Jesus Christ, the great brotherhood of light, the archangels Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Ariel, please protect us from the forces of evil during this session. Let there be nothing but light surrounding this board and its participants, and let us only communicate with the powers and entities of the light. Protect us, protect this house, the people in this house, and let there only be light and nothing but light. Amen. One other thing I should point out, Melanie and I were seated on the floor just far enough away on either side of the board so that neither of us could see what letters the planchette was landing on. That's why we had Mark seated in a chair to the side next to the board so he could peer over and write down where it landed each time. We did this because Drew kept saying how Ouija boards are fake and it's just the people's subconscious mind moving it to where they want it to go or that one of us is just messing with everyone else. Confident we had this set up in the best possible way, David asked the first question. Melanie and I's fingertips were just barely touching the planchette, our eyesight too far away to see where the board would take us. What you are about to hear is the exact transcript from that night. Are there any spirits present? Yes. Do any of you wish to communicate? Yes. How many of you are there? Three. Are there only three? G, J, Y. No. Will one step forward to talk please and what is your name? Junye. Is your name Junye? Yes. Where are you from? Six Weston Avenue. Junyan, how old are you? Six. Are you six years old, Junyan? Yes. Junyan, what town and state do you live in? I don't remember. It's okay, Junyan. How are you? I are grip. What does that mean, Junyan? What mom said. Junyan, what year were you born? Twenty-four. Junyan, what is your last name? Smithson. Junyan, have you been to school? My mom taught us. Junyan, do you have any brothers or sisters? Two brothers. Are your brothers with you? George is in heaven. Roger is here too. How old is Roger? Four. How old is George? Six, seven. Was George six or seven when he died? Yes. Where are you and Roger? right now with dad are you also with your mom no where is your mom home with George why aren't you home with your mother and George we got lost in the woods the planchette then bolted to goodbye 
and the session was over. Everyone was completely stunned. I looked over at Drew. Forget this, he said, and left the room. The rest of us remained. Mark read the answers back to us. Not once did we feel any negativity in the room. It felt just like an honest conversation we were having with a little girl. We tried researching the answers Junyan gave us, but we couldn't find anything on the internet. We never went to the local library to search further. Maybe I'll do that one of these days. That experience made me a believer. There is no explanation in my mind as to how any of us could have rigged it, subconsciously or not. Several months ago, I got out of the army and moved in with my then-girlfriend. It didn't work out, and a friend who'd given me a place to stay at her uncle's house before I joined the army five years later asked me if I wanted to move back there to keep an eye on him as his health was failing and he had no one to make sure he was okay in a secluded eight acres of mostly wooded land. Last time I lived there, there was four of us. Her uncle was in okay health for a 56-year-old and there was no need to really look after him. But now the bank is bearing down on the lean-plagued property. His dad just died, and being a single man in his early 60s with no kids or anything worth living for, his health has finally started failing him. To make matters worse, he's not helping his situation and has decided he is going to end it all by chain-smoking and drinking a handle of wild turkey every day. Since I got here, he's had on-again, off-again hacking fits, but about two weeks ago after his dad died, he began chain smoking to the point that the coughing fits have become so violent that I don't know how he hasn't died. He hacked from 2pm to 2am, the first 10 minutes being the most horrific sounds I've ever heard and at points he was doubled over and whimpering. After the first 10 minutes the hacking fits were still violent but mostly intermittent. Each time he caught a breath, he went back to smoking until he passed out around 2 a.m. from sheer hacking. Since then, he has given up on work, not changed his clothes or bathed, and his liver has begun to fail him. How do I know? Because of the smell. My dad had the same smell when his liver was crapping out, but this is ten times worse. About three or four days ago, this guy, let's call him D, went to take a shot of whiskey but simultaneously broke out in an unexpected coughing fit. I watched his face turn red and ran into my bedroom before hearing him unleash. When I came out, he'd run to his bedroom, but he'd left straight food and chunk devoid, pure liquor vomit all over the kitchen, and I have never smelled anything so vile and repugnant in my entire life. The initial stench was the scent of a genuinely rotting liver, blunt, like teeth that haven't been brushed in years by someone who spends their waking hours drinking alcohol and black coffee. As it got closer, it began to take on a powerful reek like extra strong whiskey that was tinged with the copper scent of emphysema and had a penetrating vile aroma of old, sticky sweet bile, but it was amplified times ten and the moment it hit me, I got dizzy and had to go outside to call a friend. When I came back in a couple of hours later, Dee told me he knew why I was leaving in a couple of weeks. You know you're gonna wind up finding my body lying around here. Him and I don't talk like that, but it was the first time he acknowledged his impending demise. None of this is the weirdest part though, no, not at all. The weirdest parts are the dreams. Most of them I don't even remember, even though they're terrifying, but the one I had today is the one that sent me on a spiritual cleansing tirade. Last time I lived here, everyone in the house would see a grey lump out of the corner of their eye. It stood in the archway between the living room and the computer room. You'd see it, do a double take, and then it was gone. My friend told me that it was her grandma, Dee's mom. Supposedly when she was living there, she'd like to stand in the archway. I'm not very superstitious, but since I've been here this time, she's definitely no longer around. However, something else is. I took an afternoon nap today, and I was back in my childhood neighborhood, a place of crappy memories, a canvas for all the worst nightmares I have. In the dream I go to my childhood home and my brother meets me and we go to Dee's place right around the corner. Dee begins touching my brother and becomes evil. Then we go to the house that the neighborhood bully lived in and I'm trying to fight Dee off but he continues to touch my brother. 
After a long and tiring fight, we go down the street to a house that didn't exist but was in a place where a house did exist. We enter and I begin to fight D, and I manage to kill him with two plastic katanas. Then his mom appears. I saw every last bit of her person. She had a thin puff of gray hair, with a mild part down the middle, lightly tanned skin, round coke bottle glasses. She stood at 5'5 average and couldn't be any more than 100 pounds. Something then interrupts the dream as a little old lady goes to introduce herself. It's a poem written on one of those stucco garden plaques that you made as a kid to create a fox stone walkway and it says something along the lines of, she's a demon, she's not Dee's mom, her blood is acid. She goes to open her mouth and attack, but I wake up. I saw each individual word and can still remember some of the less important ones. The dream was so surreal that I ran to the store and bought all the items for a cleansing ritual. Then I remembered something. Dee mentioned a box full of family photos somewhere in the house. I scoured the house until I found them and began looking through the photos and lo and behold, it was her. Not a thing different, even the glasses and the tan. I grew out of my spooky ghost phase years ago despite having other bizarre paranormal encounters because I believe in science but I also know that there are things I don't know and that science doesn't know and that we also don't know. And I believe that in this circumstance a demon is pretending to be his mom since he misses and loves her. The demon knows my weaknesses and knows that people used to claim his mom's spirit inhabited this place. It's preying on his emotional and physical weakness and wants to inhabit this house and I am doing everything I can to get rid of it. Something I don't even believe in. I'll be out of here by August 8th and I am thoroughly freaked out. Update I built a small altar and placed fruit since Native Americans believe spirits can still smell beyond the veil. I poured glasses of wine and beer and drew protective symbols. I burned incense and lit white candles. I put a line of salt along all thresholds and carved out an area in the garden to pray to spirits and burnt a fire for them. I asked them to protect the house and enable the house cat to tame and ward off any spirits since cats seem to have a connection to that world beyond. Also the cat loves me and will make a great guardian. I also made a figurine for good spirits to inhabit and left it at the entrance of my room. While I was doing this D left, in surprise, went to the hospital on his own accord. When he came back he quit smoking and is now speaking in full sentences again. I also cleaned the place because I believe anything evil will revel in filth, so everything got a nice cleaning and vacuuming. I also put towels over all the mirrors since they're considered doorways to the other worlds that spirits can dwell in. I'm not very superstitious, but when I am, I'm very superstitious. I've been swearing by this story since 1999. I was in grade 8 in Toronto, Canada. This was mid-December and my Catholic school was doing a school play, Birth of Christ, at a church right by Bathurst and Bloor called St. Peter's Church. I showed up earlier than anyone else to prepare, around 6.45pm. It was nearly dark. The church was very old, you can google photos and see for yourself. The lights hadn't been turned on in the basement but light crept in from the floor above, so this hallway across the basement was partly lit. The light and adjusting my eyes allowed me to find the entrance to the bathroom door. That's where I saw him, or it. I finished using the urinal, and it was pretty dark in there, and I turned around to see the face of an old man maybe three feet from my face. His gaze was a bit lower than my eye line. He wasn't lit in any way like you'd see in a movie, but you could easily make out the outline of a face that extended a bit under his neck. I remember that I was frozen in fear. I kept thinking I had to run away. It must have lasted 10-15 to 15 seconds. I lost track of time. It could have been longer. But during that time I distinctly remember thinking, if I close my eyes and run away, I will always doubt that I saw this. So, I actually stared back at it and thought, this is happening and that it clearly wasn't a living person because you could still see through it while still seeing its outline. He or it had facial features. 
He looked like an older man, maybe 50 to 60 with short hair, and his expression was calm. It didn't look friendly, but it didn't move at all, just stared right at me. After that time frame, I dashed to the door, which is very close to the urinal actually, turned and ran out of the basement. About 10 minutes later, my classmates showed up and they joked that it was probably an old man waiting to use the urinal. Only my close friends believe me. I would have doubted myself after 20-ish years of just remembering it, but I actually inspected this thing. Pure adrenaline. I was in disbelief and definitely remembered feeling 100% that it wasn't a living person. I've never had another encounter with any type of paranormal activity. I remember as a kid watching an old movie based on Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth and became fascinated by the idea of another world existing within our own. As I grew, I discovered the concept of an underworld lies not only within works of fiction but also in conspiracy theories, religion and legends. Over the years I read what I could on this subject from the hollow earth theory to underground civilizations. There was this one interesting story I came across told more than 800 years ago about two green children who emerged from the earth that I would like to share. The legends take place in the 12th century within the Suffolk village of Woolpit, England near Bury St. Edmunds. During harvest time local villagers were working in the fields when two young children emerged from dug ditches to trap wolves. A boy and a girl with green tinged skin who wore strange clothing made from unfamiliar material and spoke an unknown language. They were found wandering around bewildered by the villagers who had taken the two back to the town. The children were taken to the house of local landowner Sir Richard Del Khan, where for several days they refused to eat anything that was brought. Eventually the villagers discovered the two would eat the local harvested beans and would survive on this food for a few months to later acquire a taste for bread. The legend goes on to say as time passed on, the boy became greatly ill and died while the girl continued to grow into a young woman. She adjusted to life within the village, became baptized, learned the language and gradually her skin lost its green color. Some accounts of the myth tell that the woman took the name of Agnes Barr and married a royal official. What made this legend extraordinary was the account that this girl gave to her origins once she could be understood after learning the language. She told that her and the boy were brother and sister and came from the land of St. Martin. In her homeland there was no sun but it was perpetual twilight. The people were also green as her and her brother. She recounts that one day they were looking after their father's livestock in the fields and stumbled across a cavern. There were the loud sound of bells which they decided to check out and entered into the cave where they wandered through the darkness for some time. Eventually they exited the cavern but were immediately blinded by the glaring sunlight. After some time, they recovered and attempted to locate the mouth of the cave they exited, yet instead were found by the villagers. The story was recorded by two 12th century chroniclers, Ralph of Cogshaw, an abbot of the Cistercian Monastery at Cogshaw, and William of Newburgh, an English historian and canon at the Augustinian Newburgh Priory. This legend continues to be told and referenced over the centuries even to this day. There have been many explanations given to the solving of the green children of Woolpit. One thought that has been around since the legend was first told is that the siblings were actually from an underground world. An alternative theory suggests the children were aliens from another planet or dimension. A more practical idea has been that the two were orphans suffering from a disease causing a strange pigmentation in the skin. A simpler explanation could be the legend is nothing more than another fabricated fairy tale as other similar stories of green children later followed. We may never know for sure. I once lived in a very old house owned by my ex-husband's family for generations. I had a really bad habit of snacking at midnight. One night I was happily enjoying some Oreos and milk around midnight no lights on, I had three small children at the time who would have been drawn to the light and cookies, so I was eating in the dark. I should clarify there was plenty of moonlight to maneuver through the house. Suddenly I look up 
and standing right in front of me was an older man in a wife-beater type undershirt and boxer shorts. His hair was thinning and he was a bit on the heavy side. He had this quiet, blank stare. I ran to the only place I could, the bathroom. I stayed in there for what seemed like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, then made my way back to bed, turning on lights as I went, not even worried about waking up my children at that point. When I told my husband about it the next day, he was shocked. He showed me a picture of his grandfather who had passed years earlier in that house, and it sure did look exactly like him. His grandfather loved midnight snacks, and Oreos were his favorite. I guess he just wanted me to share, but I don't share my Oreos. I'm from upstate New York in a moderately unpopulated area. I have a large wooded area behind my house which I frequently enjoy hiking through and tending to. Much of the area has been overrun by garlic mustard, a pretty horribly invasive plant that can quickly establish and take over an area in just a few years, so I spend quite a bit of time out there in the warm months pulling out as much as I can and trying to restore native woodland plants. It's a seemingly endless battle. Anyway, as I worked my way through the woods, I noticed there was a doe standing very close to me, about 25 feet away. She just stood there, staring at me. I called out, What are you doing? to her several times and clapped my hands trying to get her to run off, as I didn't really like that she was so close and staring me down so intensely. It was funny at first, but seemed more and more off the longer she stayed. She just stood there until I finished in the area and then I drove away in my four-wheeler. Even the loud engine roar didn't scare her off. I looked back as I drove away and she was still there staring me down. About an hour and a half later I was pretty far out in my woods transplanting some things when I suddenly had the uncomfortable feeling that I was being watched again. I looked around and just across the small clearing I was standing by I noticed some kind of weird beige gray blob. Curious as to what it was, I walked closer. As I approached, it started to make more sense to me. It was what appeared to be a dead doe draped over the crotch of a tree. Something wasn't quite right though. I struggled to fully understand what I was looking at. I could see the ears, I could make out the shape of the head, and I could even see tendons bulging out of the neck. Suddenly, it hit me. I was now about 15 feet from it, and I froze as I realized the deer had no face. There should have been dark spots for the nose and eyes, and there should have been a mouth of some sort. There was nothing. It was solid, short, beige fur. The best way to describe it was the deer version of a slender man. A totally featureless, smooth, furry head. I panicked. Despite that it was a bright, warm, sunny day, I felt like I was surrounded by darkness. Everything seemed quiet and eerie, and I felt something stirring from around the deer. Though I don't think anything was physically moving, it's hard to describe. I grabbed my stuff and got out of there as quickly as I could. Luckily I had the four-wheeler with me so I had a quick escape. Despite that this thing appeared to be dead, I felt the need to get away from it, fast. Looking back, I suppose it could have just been some kind of weird hunting dummy perhaps just a dead deer with an abnormally monotone face which had collapsed and stuck together. I've been tempted to venture back out there to examine it, but I get the feeling it will either be gone or just a disgusting pile of dead decayed deer, neither of which seem to make the hike worthwhile. I'm also still pretty creeped out by it, so I have little motivation to check back in. What do you think? Just an odd occurrence? Or could this be something paranormal. This just happened this morning and I am still trying to get my head around it. I have three dogs, two German Shepherds and one Papillon. Every morning my youngest Shepherd and my Papillon go outside as soon as I get up. My older Shepherd lays in bed until I have to make her get up. This morning was no different. I was out of the shower and started doing my hair when my older Shepherd walked into the room. I was sitting on the floor and she walked right in front of me, turned around and stuck her nose on my nose, then started to walk away. I said, Hey girl, did you go outside and go potty? 
She kept just slowly walking towards the back door, so I got up to let her out. I walk into the dining room where the back door is, and she isn't there. I started going around the house. My son was still sleeping at this point, so I checked his bed to see if she crawled into bed with him. And no, nothing. I searched the whole house and went to the back door. It was closed and locked, and all of the dogs were outside. When I say my son was still sleeping, I mean he was still in that deep sleep that when I came in to ask him if he was messing with me and let the dog out, it took me about three minutes to get him awake enough to be coherent. I went back to the front door to make sure it was locked and someone else hadn't come in. The door was firmly closed and still locked. Hmm. At this point, I just chalked it up to weird and go on with my day. My son is finally up and dressed and his ride is at the house to take him to practice. I run out to talk to his ride for a second and then wave them off. I turn to come back into the house and the back door is now standing wide open and the dogs are back inside. We have a screen door on that door that was closed. Okay, maybe my son had let them in and I didn't realize it. Cool. I close the back door and go into my bedroom to finish gathering my stuff for work. My purse is sitting on the dining room table and as I turn to walk into the dining room, I see the back door standing wide open again and all of my dogs are laying in front of the closed front door staring at it like they're waiting for someone to come through. We're talking full German Shepherd head tilts, looking out front and seeing no one, so I go back into the dining room to close the door and it's shut, closed all the way and locked. I quickly grab my purse and leave the room. I hurry and get the rest of my stuff together and I'm finally ready to go. My big dogs spend the entire day outside every single day I'm at work. I was calling them to go out so I could leave and they absolutely refused. They were having none of it. I couldn't even get them into the dining room at this point. I had to leave so I grabbed their collars and tried to drag them. Not gonna happen. Fine. I take them out to the front door, walk around the house and put them in the backyard through the gate. They are fine with this but run to the back of the yard by the shed and won't come up to the house. Whatever. I'm running late so I run back into the house through the open back door, shut it and lock it, grab my keys and my purse and head out to the front door to work. I was over halfway to work when I realized I had never opened the back door or unlocked it when I tried to kick the dogs out. I couldn't get them close enough to even reach it, yet it was open when I went into the house. I'm not sure what is going on. My daughter has said this house is haunted since we moved in, but I seriously haven't believed her. She has been gone since the beginning of July, staying with her grandparents, and won't be home until next weekend. We've lived here for almost four years, so I don't get why this is just starting now. I will be going home at lunch, so I will update if anything else weird happens. Side note, the other day I got into an argument with my boyfriend over me having said the word diarrhea when a Pepto-Bismol commercial came on. I know for a fact I hadn't said it. He's convinced it was me, and he claims I've been doing it a lot, so he thought he'd mention it. Doing what? I asked. You'd say one random word, then act surprised when I ask you about it. This is true, but I just kept thinking he's losing his mind when he does this. I swear you do it when you're sleeping, and sometimes I hear you when you're not even here. Update. So I went home at lunch and my son was home. I always have to use the restroom when I get home, so I headed straight there. As I round the corner, I see a person dart into the bedroom. I tell my son to get out of there, he is the only person in the house, and he yells at me from his bedroom. So, I guess whomever we've angered is still mad. My son did say to me totally randomly that he thought that I had come home and was messing with him because the back door was open a couple of times when he went by it. I told him about it this morning and he said he also thinks the house feels off. Update number two. It's 3am and I haven't been able to sleep. My dogs have been restless and I needed to do something. I'm a mom and I have the need to protect us. Someone suggested sage as did my friend so that is what we did about midnight. The house feels much lighter and almost back to normal. The activity seems to have ceased and my dogs are all sleeping peacefully. To those who suggested an intruder, my first thought was intruder and my house was thoroughly searched. I concealed carry and made sure I was armed. My house is very small and the crawl space under the house was searched as well as the attic. There was no sign of any living creature. 
not even trails or poo to indicate animal activity. For the first time since my friend's death, she appeared to me. After the burning of the sage and several prayers, I walked out of my bedroom and see her standing by my front door with that gorgeous smile on her face, and I knew whatever was here was finally gone. My boyfriend won't be home until Sunday morning, so I have no idea if the random words have stopped. I wouldn't put it past my friend to troll my boyfriend. She's always been mischievous, and what better way to mess with someone? I hope that this is my last update. It's been a terrifying 24 hours, but I have a feeling we shifted the balance back in the house, and things will be getting better from now on. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you don't use Twitter or Facebook, be sure to follow me on Instagram that I have just recently started up, and maybe you'll catch a cool picture that I put on there, or something. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just never post on it. Hopefully I will. Okay, bye!